sisters amen. amen would you rise with me today and let's prepare our hearts for worship as we begin with our invocation prayer father we thank you that you have gathered us brothers and sisters together to worship you today lord we invite your spirit lord jesus we lift you up we long for your presence and power to shine through in our midst. And, oh God, we pray that you might touch our hearts in a cleansing way that will help our eyes to be open, our ears to hear, and our hearts to trust in your goodness, mercy, and love through Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, and our King. Amen. Let us prepare and sing together today hymn number 62, All Creatures of Our God and King. Will you worship with us and sing 62? All creatures of our God and King.
Amen. You may be seated. Wonderful job. Way to lift your hallelujahs to the Lord today. We move into our time of prayer this morning, and as we do, uh, a couple of requests to remember. Please, you'll notice in our bulletin there's an opportunity to pray for our uh, prayers for healing strength, so for remember them. But in addition, uh, Melanie Scarborough came through surgery this week, and last I talked with her, she's doing well. Uh, but keep her in your prayers. Carolyn Hardy, her family needs your prayers as she died this week. And uh, I don't know of any arrangements as of yet. I know they may do something a little more family-oriented, but I'll let you know when we find that, that out. Uh, Tom Christian as well, keep him in prayer. And then uh, remember Haiti and the hostages of Christian missionaries there. And Belarus is in chaos as well. So our heart goes out to uh, our world there. But before we go to our time of prayer this morning, Thursday was Veterans Day, so uh, just for a brief moment, I want to invite, if you ha are a veteran and have served in the military uh, in any of the branches, would you stand? And we just want to give thanks to you on this Veterans Day weekend. Amen. Uh, they had a wonderful uh, veterans ceremony at the Walk of Heroes on Thursday, and uh, it is a special time to give thanks for all and everyone who served in the military and uh, done more than their part to uh, help protect our country and keep us safe. Will you join me then and let's pray together? Heavenly Father, we praise you. We give thanks for your goodness and mercy and love that never fails. And as your people, we cry out and come before you. We thank you for this day that you've made. We rejoice. We're, we're in it. And Father God, we just come before you, asking your mercy and forgiveness. We seek you together today. We pray that if there is anything in our heart or in our mind or in our life that would be an obstacle of sin or uh, hostility, Lord, that may keep us from hearing your word and from knowing that you're near and sensing your presence. Lord, tear down every obstacle this morning by the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord God, as we come to you, we pray that you'd heal the sick in our midst that are in our minds and on our hearts. Lord, we pray that you will comfort the grieving who have lost loved ones. We remember Carolyn Hardy's family. She was, has been such a vibrant light of faith and love in this community, and she will be missed. We pray bless her children who are grieving today and uh, watch over their coming and going in days to come. Father God, we remember our community and pray that your spirit will lead us and guide us as we lift up our community. We pray as well for our veterans today and for our present military men and women who are uh, stationed all over the planet. Some are far away from family today on the other side of the world. Lord, we pray the light of your love that it would be near them in all occasions. Lord, in dark places, help them stay close to you that they may be soldiers of light and peacemakers as much as possible in dangerous places. But we pray you'll bless them and strengthen them and bless their families on this Veterans Day weekend. And Father God, we pray as well for our nation and our world. We give thanks for all those who serve and protect us, police, firefighters, paramedics. Lord, we cry out to you that you would bring a new light of love into our lives that you'd bring a, the Holy Spirit revival and renewal, that you would start right here with us and get us on fire for you. Help us offer all that we are to you. Let us hold nothing back, that your kingdom may grow, that you may transform communities and families and our nation together. And Father God, we pray as well that you will transform our world, that the good news of the gospel would be proclaimed to the ends of the earth, that you'd be light in darkness and work in our midst in Haiti 
and also in Belarus. Lord, may your love and grace watch over these places of conflict today. May you be with our brothers and sisters in Haiti who are in captivity and bring light and healing to our land. Oh God, do more than we could ask or imagine. As we pray together the prayer that, Lord Jesus, you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would our ushers come forward as we have an opportunity to make an impact through our giving. And I thank you for all you give to invest in God's work here at Conyers First.
Father, we thank you that you have blessed us in so many areas of life. You've given to us everything we need in life. And so, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give our gifts back for your work of offering your hope, your joy, your light, and your love to the ends of the earth. Bless the gifts and the giver. May they make an impact for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, you may be seated. This time we have a special opportunity. Uh, the uh, Wood family is coming up for a baptism of little Gary. So come on down. And the rest of the family, y'all can kind of gather on this side. I think that'll be fine. I know he's been waiting eagerly for this. So, yeah. All right. Yep. All right, brothers and sisters, uh, we invite you to join with us. You'll find it printed on your bulletin. We're also going to say the Apostles' Creed, which was originally the creed said at baptism in the midst of this and for this you'll need your hymnals because it's not the normal way to do it so you need to turn to page 35 because the words are a little different and we're going to do it as a question and response so just just note that all right brothers and sisters in christ baptism is a visible sign of the grace of our lord jesus christ and through this grace we welcome his gift of forgiveness and righteousness and open our hearts to his gift of eternal life those who receive the sacrament are marked as christian disciples and welcomed into the fellowship of christ's holy church our lord jesus has given to little children like gary a home among the people of god which we dare not deny them so remember the words of the lord jesus and how he said let the children come to me do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of god and so, uh, Chris and Helen, do you guys, in presenting uh, Gary for holy baptism, do you reject all the evil powers of this world, repent of your sin, and confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Because of your faith, will you accept God's call and your responsibility to live before Gary a life that expresses the good news of God? We will. Will you both nurture him so that she so that he might become to know Jesus as Savior and Lord? Will you teach him so that he will learn God's holy scriptures, be an example for him so that he learns the key importance of both private and public worship of God? Will you strive to keep him under your care, ministry, guidance of the church until he, by God's gracious gift of grace in his life, will accept for himself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a maturing disciple of Christ's holy church? Good job. All right. Everybody else, now you guys have a role as well. These parents and this family need your help. So do you all, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of evil and sin and your commitment to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Amen. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and also nurture Gary, who is now before you, who is placed in your care, and surround him with a community of love and forgiveness? All right, I invite you to join with me as we share together in the Apostles' Creed found on page 35 of your hymnal. Brothers and sisters, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. All right. He's doing great. See if he'll come on in. Hey there, buddy. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, you're a happy guy. Yeah. All right, here we go. It's going to be a little wet, okay? <laughs> Gary Errol Wood, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's doing great. Yeah, you're talking to me, aren't you? Everybody want to see him. Brothers and sisters, on this day, also remember your baptism. Remember that moment where your parents maybe gave you in faith to Jesus Christ. Or where you were baptized as an adult and you decided to follow Jesus. Let's remember our baptism on this day and be thankful together. Amen? Amen. All right. Family, if you'll come over here, we want to have a prayer of blessing for Gary. Parents, I invite you to put your hands on him. And guys, y'all put your hands on the parents or on little Gary here. And let's give him a blessing. Lord, we thank you for Gary's life. We thank you that you love him right now, Lord. You have made him for yourself. You want the very best for him. And so, Lord, we pray he may know you, Father. He may embrace the Lord Jesus, and he might be filled with the Holy Spirit all his day. And so, Lord, we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. He's quite a talker. All right, one more Let's uh, before we wrap up. I'll give you another little blessing here. Uh, if I can find it. The Holy Spirit fill you, work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful and mature disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Members of the Conyers First Family, I commend to your loving care, Gary, whom we this day recognize as a member of God's family. Will you all strive to live so that all our children may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior Jesus Christ? With God's help, we will so mold our lives after the example of Christ so that they might be surrounded by God's unconditional love, may be grounded in the faith, and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Let us pray. God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory through our Savior Jesus Christ, may he establish you and strengthen this family by the power of his Holy Spirit, so that you may live in his grace, share his peace, and shine bright God's light to the ends of the earth. Amen. Good job, guys. Yeah. This time, the glory of Patri, I guess. Y'all want to stand up for the glory of Patri? What a great day to celebrate a baptism together, and we're excited for Errol and Kathleen's family, for Helen and Chris, and for Gary. But as we look to the scripture today, uh, there's a scripture that fits this really well that we're going to look at. We're going to look at Hannah's story, and it, it fits this baptism moment incredibly well. 
as we continue through our short series on words that change the world. Words that change the world. Last week, we looked at how the word of blessing from Jacob shaped a family and a nation in an incredible way as our words of blessing can shape our children's future and our friends' and neighbors' future as well. This week, we look at Hannah's story. Hannah wasn't having a great time in life. She was struggling in desperate moments. And maybe some of you today, your lives have a sense of desperation to them as well. And so I hope you'll learn from Hannah's desperate prayer. And so uh, we look back 3,000 years ago, before Israel had any kings, there were judges in the land. They were a loose confederation, and there was a fella who was from the tribe of Ephraim, and his name uh, was Elkanah. And Elkanah was married to two ladies, which you could do that back then, Hannah and Paniah. And Paniah had kids. Hannah did not. And so we pick up the story there at Shiloh, where the tabernacle of the Lord is. They've come to worship together. And here's how the story goes. In the fourth verse, Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Paniah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year, and whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she cried and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they'd finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you'll only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart with her lips moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. So Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something. Her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then they went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And so in the course of time Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me? Lord Jesus, as we come to you today, sometimes life hits us hard. And I pray for those who've been in that situation or in that situation right now, that they may find hope in the life and the story, but especially the prayer of Hannah. So Lord Jesus, help me lift you up that we may trust you with all that we are. In Christ's name, amen. Brothers and sisters, it'd be great if life was always great and everything always went really well and, and all those things. We never had any bad experiences or any hard times to go through. But unfortunately, 
Life's not really like that. And so perhaps this morning you can relate to Hannah's experience where she longed to be a mom. And in the ancient culture, to be a a married lady and not a mom was like a huge, huge burden. And so we see in this instance that she has come to a place of desperation. Uh, She has a, a, a rival wife, which fortunately we don't have that kind of thing today. And this story kind of teaches us why we don't do that kind of thing today. But this rival wife would kind of always egg her on and always make fun of her and ha ha ha, look at my family and you don't have any kids. And it says as a result, Hannah would just not want to eat and not want to worship and not want to do anything. She was in the pit of despair. She was at a place of desperation. In my own life, there have been a a few times in my life where things seemed desperate in a similar way to Hannah. Uh, For Andrea and I, we had experienced for, you know, a year of trying to get pregnant and nothing happened. And so you begin to wonder, uh, what's going on? Are we going to be able to have children or not? But other instances I know as well, there were three times where I've prayed a prayer of desperation similar to Hannah. And God has been there as he was with Hannah in my life too. The first one was when my granny, who I loved dearly, shortly after I got married, she had congestive heart failure and she wasn't doing particularly well. I remember we're at Georgia Tech still and we had a little three or four room uh, duplex where we lived and I got down on my knees and prayed at uh, my couch that was there and I just cried out to the Lord and said Lord I'm not ready for granny to go to heaven yet I really want to see her stay around please heal her and after doing this for 10 or 15 minutes I had a similar experience that Hannah experienced and that is there came this sense of peace like God said okay I'll take care of it and my grandmother found strength to go on another about four years three or four years I was thankful for that. Then a second time, I remember, was uh, trying to become a preacher. And in becoming a preacher, you got to go for the Board of Ordained Ministry, where you are face-to-face with like 60 men and women who are, you know, giants in the annual conference. And they scare you to death by asking you all these questions. Are you good enough? Are you fit enough? Why do you think you can preach the gospel of Jesus? And as I went out of that meeting, something kind of inside me said, that did not go as well as I'd hoped. (laughs) And sure enough, shortly after that, a couple of the guys who were kind of mentors to me came and said, Chris, we're sorry, but but the conference isn't sure that you're cut out for this or not. So we want to defer you for a year and sort of see how things go. We'll give you some things to do. And You know, it it suffice to say, telling Andrea that that our future was all kind of up in the air and I'd have to kind of be in limbo for a year was not news she wanted to hear. And in that moment, all the way home, again, I was crying out to the Lord, Lord, see me through this mess. And eventually the Holy Spirit came and God said, Chris, I'll, I'll see you through. I'll take care of it. Just hang on. I think of a third time when my grandfather, uh, just about 10, 12 years ago, he was at death's door. And he had been a skeptic of faith his whole life. He'd kind of always pushed to decide and made fun of folks like me and Christians. And, and I was down to Fayetteville to see him one last time because he was in the hospital with MRSA and not doing particularly well. So all the way down there, I'm praying to the Lord, Lord, would you please help my grandfather in this moment and in my time with him find hope in Jesus? And again, after praying about halfway down to Fayetteville, I felt the Spirit say, Chris, I hear you. I'll take care of it. You see, brothers and sisters, like in Hannah's case, there is something incredibly powerful about our prayers, but especially our prayers in times of desperation. For some reason, when we're desperate, I think maybe we're more honest, maybe we're more sincere, maybe we're more humble, maybe we're more, 
I don't know. We just we know we've got to get a hold of God. And so whatever we have to do, we will do it. Because in this moment, we need to know that the one who made us is there by our side. And that's where Hannah comes in this time of prayer. Though she didn't pray out loud, though she was just praying in her heart, we see her move and ask the Lord Almighty to to do a couple of things. The first thing is, is she prays, Lord, see me in my misery and remember me. Remember me. And brothers and sisters, if you're ever in a crisis, even if you're not in a crisis, a great prayer to pray is, Lord, remember me. Lord, see me. I'm a mess right now. My circumstances are chaotic right now. I don't know how I'm going to make it another day. All I know is I need you, Lord, in this moment to see how I feel and how I hurt and the pain I'm in, and I need to know that you know that I'm here. And so that's a powerful prayer for any of us to pray. Then she added to it and said, Lord, second thing is I'd really like a son. And so if you give me a son, I'd tell you what I'll do. I'll give him right back to you. Make of him what you will. I trust you with his life and the life of my family. We then get the interaction between Eli and her and and how that goes. But uh, in this moment, we see her desperation. We see her kneel in prayer and ask God to work in her heart and life. And then we see, as Eli responds in a positive way, may the Lord bless you and do what you've asked. We see her let the burden go. We see her lay her prayer down and get up in hope that God has heard and God has answered. As I said, in those times of desperation for me, I've seen God do similar things. I hope you have too. Because when we know that God has answered, we can trust that his goodness will be at work. Now, I want to condition this just a little bit because I don't want to be telling you that God will answer every prayer of desperation just as you pray it. I can't guarantee that because prayer is not something we demand of God. It's something we request of God. And to kind of help us with this, I want to share a little bit from C.S. Lewis, the great uh, English evangelist and apologist of the 1960s. C.S. Lewis was talking about the power of prayer. And can we really believe prayer makes any difference at all or not? And so he's wrestling with that question a little bit, but it's his final conclusion that is also helpful for us to think about in our prayer life. This is what he shares. Some years ago, I got up one morning intending to have my hair cut in preparation for a visit to London. And the first letter I opened made it clear I didn't need to go to London. So I decided to put the haircut off too. But then there began the most unaccountable little nagging in my mind, almost like a voice saying, get it cut all the same. Go, get it cut. In the end, I could stand it no longer, so I went. Now, my barber at the time was a fellow Christian and many, a man of many troubles whom my brother and I had sometimes been able to help. The moment I opened his shop door, he said, Oh, I was praying that you might come today. And in fact, if I had come a day or so later, I should have been of no use to him at all. So it awed me. It awes me still. But of course, one cannot rigorously prove a causal connection between the barber's prayer and my visit. It might be telepathy. It might be an accident. I've stood at the bedside of a woman whose thigh bone was eaten away through with cancer, who had thriving colonies of the disease and many other bones as well. It took three people to move her in bed. The doctors predicted a few months of life The nurses, who often know better, only a few weeks. A good man laid his hands on her and prayed. And a year later, the patient was walking uphill, too, through the rough woodland. 
And the man who took the x-ray photos was saying, these bones are as solid as rock. It's miraculous. But once again, there is no rigorous proof. Medicine, as all true doctors admit, is not an exact science. We need not invoke the supernatural to explain the falsification of its prophecies. You need not, unless you choose, believe in a causal connection between the prayers and the recovery. The question then arises, what sort of evidence would prove the efficacy or the power of prayer? The thing we pray for may happen, but how can you ever know that it was not going to happen anyway? Even if the thing were indisputably miraculous, it would not follow that the miracle had occurred because of your prayers. The answer surely is that a compulsive empirical proof such as we have in the sciences can never really be attained. But some things are proved by unbroken uniformity of our experiences. The law of gravitation is established by the fact that in our experience, all bodies, without exception, obey gravity. Now, even if all the things that people prayed for happened, which they do not, this would not prove what Christians mean by the efficacy or the power of prayer. For prayer, this last line is what I want you to catch most of all. For prayer is request. The essence of request, indistinct from compulsion, is that it may or may not be granted. Prayer is request. And the distinct from compulsion is that it may or may not be granted. And so with these desperate prayers, we have to trust in a loving and good God to give us the good answer. Sometimes that good answer may not be what we want to hear. I know uh, my own dad's mom died of cancer when he was a teenager. My uncle, his dad died at a young age when he was a teenager. And my uncle, we're doing his funeral today. Um, Some things we pray for and we don't get what we ask. But what C.S. Lewis tells us is a couple of things. One, he says, I do believe in prayer because these things happen when I pray and when others pray. He says, I can't really prove it, but I do believe it. And the second thing he tells us, ultimately I have to trust that prayer is a request. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer can be no. But as the fruit of prayer comes forward, we see how our prayers of desperation, brothers and sisters, can make a huge difference. In Hannah's case, she just didn't receive a new baby boy named Samuel. But as she offers Samuel to the Lord, she sends him away to stay around the tabernacle for the rest of his life. He goes on to become the last and the leading judge of Israel a leader that they desperately needed because they looked around and they couldn't find any quality leaders at all. Eli was getting old. His sons who were priests were not faithful. They needed a leader. There was a vacuum there and Samuel grew to be the one who would fill it. But he wasn't just a a, a judge. He was also part priest, though he wasn't even from Aaron's family or a Levite not only was he a priest but he was also a prophet and guided Israel through his words as well as his service in so much of a way did he have an impact not just on Hannah but he had an impact on the entire nation of Israel he went on to give them and anoint their first king King Saul He went on to call out and anoint their second king, King David, from whom Jesus' lineage would come. Samuel became a key figure for the renewal of a nation, all because Hannah, in her desperation, was willing to pray a powerful prayer. What might God do if we, like Hannah, will cry out to the Lord and ask him to make a difference in our lives and in our family. How might the Lord make that difference? As we take our children, as we take our grandchildren, and don't hold them to ourselves, 
But like Hannah, say, Lord, I give my kids to you. I dedicate their lives to you. Make of Samuel what you will for your glory. When we do that, there is no telling what God might do, not just to bless our families, but to bless our community and our nation and our world. Our prayers can make a tremendous impact. And I hope today, no matter what you're going through, that you find hope in your desperate moments, that you can see God make a difference in your life as well. I close with one final story. Again, it's from Fred Craddock. I've used his stories I know, two or three weeks in a row. That's not been intentional. I know some of you are thinking, well, Chris is just trying to find a Fred Craddock story and throw it in every week. I really am not. It's just I keep getting into topics and then saying, well, you know what? Fred has this amazing story. I might as well use it. He has much more interesting stories than I do. So Fred was going to uh, the hospital in Fannin County up in north uh, west Georgia one day, and this is where he shares. I've met a desperate person since we moved to the mountains. It is a woman. I'd gone to the hospital in Fannin County to visit someone else. I didn't know her. I didn't know I would encounter her. But when I went down the corridor, I saw her. Her head was against the door. Both fists were up beside her face. And she was banging on the door. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. I couldn't imagine someone locking her out of the room. So I got there, and it was the chapel door. I said, let me help you. I tried to open the door, but the knob wouldn't turn. It was locked. So I stopped a worker and I said, the chapel is locked. And she said, well, you know, we have to keep it locked. There were some kids in there some time ago and they trashed the chapel and we had to get new furniture and paint the room. We can't afford to keep doing that, so we keep it locked. Well, find someone with the key. She came back a little while later with another woman who opened the door for us and this woman and I went in. I would say she was about 40. She had the look of desperation I could tell that she hadn't come to the hospital with any planning she came urgently she came running the dress she had on was not a typical public wear dress she had no shoes just scuffs her hair had not been combed no makeup she had the look of desperation and she had the voice of desperation I can't tell you if she was screaming or crying or moaning or what it was but it was desperation. Strange sound. I heard some of her words. I know he's going to die. I know he's going to die. I know he's going to die. Who? My husband. What's the matter? He's had a heart attack. I said, can I get you some water? She said, no. I told her who I was, and I said, can I pray with you? She said, Please. So I started to pray for her and for her husband. And she interrupted me. She didn't just interrupt me. She took over. She started praying herself and stopped my prayer. You know, I think maybe I was too quiet or too slow or saying something wrong or something. Anyway, my prayer wasn't getting there and she knew it. So she said, Lord, this is not the time to take my husband. You know that better than I do. He's not ready. He never prays, never goes to church or anything. He's not ready. It's not a good time to take him. Don't take him now. And what about me? If I have to raise these kids, what am I going to do? I don't have any skills. I can't find work. I quit school to marry him. If I'd known you were going to take him, I'd have stayed in school. She was really talking to God. And what about the kids? They don't mind me now with him around. If he's gone, they'll be wild as bucks. What about the kids? This is not the time to take my husband. Whew. I stayed as long as I felt useful. And I went back the next morning. And she had on a nice dress. She had on shoes and had combed her hair. She looked fine. She was in the hallway outside intensive care. And before I could ask, she said, He's better. She smiled and said, 
I'm sorry about that crazy woman yesterday. And I said, well, you weren't crazy. She said, well, I guess the Lord heard one of us. And I said, he heard you. She was desperate. She had God by the lapels, by both hands, and was screaming in God's face, I don't think you're listening. That's desperation. And brothers and sisters, when we go through moments like that, cry out to the Lord. Ask Him to remember you. Ask Him to do a miracle in your behalf. And then to have faith. Have faith that as you grab him by the lapels, he will be there for you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. As I close our time together, one more little word about the story. Some of you may know, some of you may not. Hannah went on and had three more boys and another two girls. As she offered them to the Lord, God brought his blessing in ways we couldn't ask or imagine. And God's kind of God that does that. We go through a time of trial for a season, and as we stay faithful and let him be with us, he finds a way to step in and bless us more abundantly than we could ask or imagine. So let's close in prayer. Father, as we come to you today, I know there are some folks here have experienced those moments of desperation. And I thank you, God, because you saw them through those moments like you've seen me through. And Father, I know there are some maybe here today who are in a moment of desperation. I pray, help them follow Hannah. Cry out to you and grab you by the lapels and ask you to remember us to see us, to work in our midst and do a miracle in our lives that we may know that we're not alone, that we may know that as we offer all that we are to you, as we offer our children to you, that you can turn them for good in ways that touch not only us, but can touch the world around us. So Lord, help us trust you in our moments of desperation, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we close this morning, some of you, you may be in a position where you feel that desperation. I hope you might be willing to come to the altar and pray here as we close with our closing hymn today. So I invite you to stand as we sing, Now Thank We All Our God. Hymn number 102, let's stand and sing and worship the Lord together.
Amen. Thanks for being with us today. May the Lord, our Father, go before you to bless you, to watch over you, and to know that he is with you. Go in the light of the Son who's died for us, who conquered death for us, and who has promised to be beside us through all things. And in your moment of desperation, trust the Holy Spirit and his power to intercede, to guide you through, and to be with you in your moment of need. He will be with you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Amen.